Oh my God, the chat's getting upset here. They were like, oh, are we going to start? Are we going to ever start? Oh my. I'm sorry, I was uh, out of town. I just raced back for the Hunley episode of uh, <laughs> National Lampoon's Greatest Hits. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we, we've got a couple things here. Now, we do have a couple things that, well, we can't really show here because it's National Lampoon and there are people getting naked in National Lampoon. And you can't really show naked people. On YouTube, because what do you, do, what do, you do in that case? Um, well, we could put. I've talked about it, and I think for local subscribers, maybe I should oh, put up right, the okay. uh, yeah, why not? put up the link to where they can go peruse damn near every issue of National Lampoon that I've um, saved up. Okay. Um, after the show, I think we can do that. You All found right, a couple of movies I downloaded. We'll upload as well. Right. And well, um, somebody just piled screenshot after screenshot and cover after cover on me throughout oh, me. the day yeah so yeah, well, we, we've got a lot we've got a lot to cover um so i did it the last folks, minute i was on vacation sorry yeah no i'm no 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 he, he, he piled in on folks so remember first off okay yeah we got to do this first <laughs> yeah that's what everybody else does and they've got a billion subscribers so we better do it honey yeah and you know what it really does help it does I, i'm seeing i'm seeing that the uh numbers are are coming in okay all right and oh my god they're still on it what time does a 5 30 show start Probably it shows it's after 5 30 okay <laughs> and, and then rumble it might even be in a minute after that what are you gonna do oh cute america's untold stories national lampoon's greatest <laughs> that's funny yeah it is um anyway subscriptions help consider it i know a lot of you watch it very consistently if you hit the subscribe it does help Gets more notifications out there, helps spin it to the algo. And what about ringing the bell? Is that something? The notification bell? Should yes. they do? What is that? Do? In theory, it's supposed yeah. to be if you take the bell and you choose all, you're supposed to always be notified. Right on. People right complain on. though that they don't get notifications, and I know it's happened to me. Right. So nothing. I don't get any notifications. It always happens to me. Okay. Although I have been subpoenaed, so I, I have gotten notifications. No, yeah, you have. Well, you get notifications. I get there. different notifications. Yeah. Yeah, you have people coming to the um, Mr. Grobear, Mr. Grobear. Yes. Is this yes. Mr. Grobear? Yes. Here, Go got on. something for you. I got something for you. All right. So, you okay? So today we're covering. I'm guessing not just your time at National Lampoon, but National Lampoon itself. Because no, there's that a would lot be more wrong. There. Because I. I don't have the time to cover the, the history of National Lampoon. We've touched on that, um, and there's a lot of media out there you can watch: Drunk, Brilliant, Stone, Dead, the uh, the Doc, and the Book. Uh, mm -hmm. Stupid, Feudal Gesture, I think, is a uh, feature film. But I recommend both of those if you want to see the entire history of Lampoon. They got uh, it right. What's that? They got them right, then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Both the Doc and the. Um, and the feature film are pretty damn good. Um, I, they did get it right. And they're not great. I mean, but they're really informative. And I'd recommend it for the entire history. I wasn't there in 1970. So it's, you know, me talking about it doesn't really matter. Uh, they talk about it. And there's some people still alive uh, who were there at the beginning. And I wasn't one of them. But that being said, I kind of know the history. But, you know, that's I, I could only really comment on what I was doing there, you know. Right, right. Well, we have we have covers that go all the way back in the '70s, so I figured that there was right. I mean, we could film. we could we could show a visual history of the Lampoon. I could give a cursory background to the the magazine, but uh, let me just tell you this: like, this is where in our storyline, the custom shop ends and the mm. Lampoon begins. Just so people have a linear timeline of 1985, when I get out of the custom shop. I was kind of waiting there in limbo to do this. If that yeah, that, you were, you were, you had been tipped, right? That yeah. there may be something opening, and so you were just kind of. Well, I was tipped, all right. It was called cronyism. See, I, <laughs> I was so tipped that I was on the inside for years. Uh, I went to college with Michael Simmons, who was Maddie Simmons' son, the owner of National Lampoon. So I didn't really care about that in 1974, 75, but. 
we became best friends and apparently I was funny, made him laugh. And, you know, we just bonded together when we were at Bard and became very close friends. And, you know, he came up to Sonora House. He had one of the greatest country bands in New York, uh, Michael Simmons and Slewfoot. Uh, I had managed his band at one point, actually having them open in Poughkeepsie a couple of times for Sleep at the Wheel, another time Commander Cody, uh, at a place called the um, hmm. Sal's Last Chance. I think I'm really stretching my memory here. Uh, the, the nightclub and different uh, theaters in, in that uh, Mid-Hudson region. But Simmons himself had one of the greatest rock and roll voices of all times, plus a Sinatra type voice. Um, amazing, amazing vocalist got into swing and country and put a whole series of bands together and wrote for Rolling Stone and also um, Mojo now out of England quite a bit. Um, just an incredible writer, but a, a really renowned as a singer. And everyone in the music business knows him um, as a guy with an incredible voice. That being mm -hmm. said, um, in 1985, when the openings did come, um, I was brought in at that time with him and his brother, Andrew Simmons. Um, but before that, I had literally been like a friend of the family because I was hanging out at his house for years. And when I mean house, I mean house. His father, uh, Maddie, inventor something called Diners Club, which was the first credit card. Oh, yeah. I remember right? that. That's his claim to fame was inventing Diners Club. And what he did was in Westport, Connecticut, they gave like 500 people a plastic card with a line of credit on it and interest rates. And this had never been done before, Eric. Mm -hmm. And this was an experiment that took off back by Diners Club. And there was a magazine involved with that. And that's Maddie's background. And when you get into the Harvard boys who came to Maddie, uh, uh, Doug Kenny and, <clears throat> and Henry Beard and uh, Surf, I think it was, when they came to, or Hoffman rather, I take it back, Surf was uh, later as an editor, but Hoffman and, and, and Kenny and uh, the three of them came to, to Maddie, there's Doug Kenny. It's actually in the Lampoon office, uh, Madison Avenue, Doug Kenny had an incredible ability, among other abilities, to put his entire fist in his mouth. Uh, what that meant, I have no idea. <laughs> that was, he would do this around the office and uh, freak people out. Um, Doug Kenny, of course, wrote Animal House. He also wrote Caddyshack and was a genius from the Midwest. And a lot of these guys were from the Midwest. A lot of them were, were there's, there he is on the set of Caddyshack, actually. Um, he must have been saying, where are we going to put that candy bar? Well, he was not happy with the success of Caddyshack and spiraled into a black hole. And uh, although Caddyshack's perceived to be a hit, when you have Animal House as your first hit, Mm -hmm. Caddyshack was considered by him to be a letdown. And um, he wrote a novel. He went off to write a novel called Teenage Commies from Outer Space, which also was not well received. But um, the thing with Beard and Hoffman and, and, and Kenny was um, they had a contract with Maddie where after five years or some period of time, Maddie, uh, or the three of them could ask Maddie to buy them out at any time. And mm. they waited until the stock was at its incredible highest point. And they went to Maddie and said, we're, we're getting out. And he tried everything to talk him out of it. Screaming, cajoling. Uh, <laughs> I, the guy went crazy. He stood on his desk. He was yelling at them. But at the end of the day, he had to go across the street on 59th and Madison and go into that bank and come out with a briefcase full of millions of dollars. And each one of them got a couple of million each. And Kenny said, I'm out of here. They all said they're out of here. They said they're done. Kenny left and, you know, obviously stayed to do these Lampoon projects and disappeared and did come back later. Uh, not as strong as when he was originally there, but the money was really too much for them to handle. The, the That's other real, that was real, freaking real money crazy. back in cash. No, in cash, bro. I mean, he literally <laughs> had to go across the street to the bank. It killed Maddie. Now, Maddie was kind of a, I, I, let me just back up because there were people in the office, just, just, just so you know, the magazine was not run by us. The magazine was run by straight people who knew how to run magazines. That the, oh. the people who worked there were veteran adults with families who lived on Long Island. The, it was not us. We were on the creative side. 
But there was an entire team of executives who put up with our crap and put out the magazine every month, making deals with the mob, subscription deals. Who the hell knows what they did? Newsstand. The dirty underbelly of the magazine business should be explored in a documentary at some point. Not just about this magazine, but about all of them. Mm -hmm. And these guys, we had a guy named George Agoli, a Italian guy, and he was the publisher. We had another guy named Len Mogul, who was also, uh, I think, vice president. Len Mogul literally wrote the book on how to make magazines, taught at NYU. Total straight mm -hmm. guy, um, wonderful guy, the antithesis of Maddie Simmons, the opposite. Maddie was loud, brash, cigar chomping, uh, you know, in your face, like a mogul, like a movie mogul, which he became in 78 and then mm -hmm. again with you know vacations and then european vacations and some of the other productions when we got involved in 85 maddie was mostly staying on the coast so we were able to run the asylum because there was no maddie and every time he'd come back he would just go what the f is going on here i mean he fired me twice that's yeah. a bad of honor everybody got fired at some point i think i got fired twice but <laughs> the, the, re the reality of it was, it was uh, pretty raucous. You know, I mean, look, whatever happened in the 70s, what happened with uh, 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 Tony Hendra in the 80s and Sean Kelly and PJ and all those guys, that was their world. You know what I mean? Like, we had our own creative things. And in 1985, Peter Kleinman, who was also featured in the documentary, he was my art director at the time. Kleinman is in the doc, uh, Drunk Stone brilliant dead, whatever it is. Um, Kleinman um, decided on his own, not editorially, for some artistic reason, to put a fold-out centerfold like penthouse of mm. a baby in a blender with Satan pushing the button on the on the blender. And I don't know if you have a shot of this baby. In, yeah, here it is. This, this brainchild by Kleinman, <laughs> which nobody saw coming, ended up infuriating the Mies Commission and Reverend Donald Wildman, who had a uh, right-wing religious fanatical group going after us, Penthouse and Playboy. And this thing almost killed the entire magazine. You know, it's funny because that actually um, po kept popping into my head and I kept bringing it up because of the Amber Heard testimony about the microwave. And, you know, I people know are saying that. the baby in the microwave. I'm like, yeah, next she's going to come up with a baby in the blender. Oh, right. Or okay. Well, that, we that. did come up with a baby in the blender. And look, when I when I came on there, my, I didn't have the writing chops that I would have years later. And I was into multimedia stuff. So what I focused on was more visual art and m creating visual stuff because I had an entire brilliant art department where you could come up with something. And in, in an hour, they've created it. It, it. it was really a fantasy for me to wow. be able to come up with these harebrained schemes in my mind, cartoon wise, visual wise, or photo layout wise, and to have them made into art and into magazine pieces. And I tried to play with the avant-garde nature of that art. And my heroes were like Doug Kenny, who did the Vietnamese baby book, uh, who did uh, you know parodies, visual parodies. These other guys were great at doing literary parody, which I didn't have the chops to do at the age of 29, there's the Vietnamese, it's part of it, that's the baby's handprint. The baby lives from like 1972 to 1973 or something. It's really sick. It's but very dark. Was, what's that? It's very dark, but it does it's represent very dark, the but war. It was, it was I mean, a statement against the war, right, absolutely. So like, when I w was involved in stuff like this, when I found out, for instance, that they had captured Klaus Barbie, uh, uh, the butcher, from from Leon, as he was known, and he was captured, I think, in Bolivia uh, by undercover agents, and he was extradited to France to stand trial. Somebody in the British press said, and I don't know if they were serious or not, what is Klaus Barbie going to wear at the trial? You want to talk about trials? How preposterous a question this was. So I came up with, you know, combining the Barbie doll or the layout of color forms with the Klaus Barbie doll, I combined the two things into into one spread with these different outfits where you can cut them out of the magazine and put them on onto Klaus Barbie's body, in other words. So I don't know if you have a... Uh, I do. Um, I'm not finding it, though, damn it. Okay. So, no, I mean... So I, far, I have so this, good. Yeah, we're, we're doing great here. Now. Right. So anyway, so I, maybe he'll find it at some point. The Klaus Barbie doll um, was... 
really raised a lot of eyebrows at the time. And I started to do more and more visual uh, colored art pieces. Um, I'm trying to think now the, 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 well, we, we could talk about sexual jeopardy, the home game while you're looking for Klaus Barbie. I did a, <laughs> I did a sexual version of jeopardy uh, the home game where, yeah, this is the, the, the answers and they were all, transvestites for 20, Catholic church for 20, famous sex teachers, homosexuality, historic sex toys. And on the back of the page were the, the, the questions, you know, like Jeopardy. So I, I began to get into a type of art that had pages. Uh, the art was on both sides of the pages. And I've never seen that done before. And it had to be done somewhere, but I really got into doing it where I would show the back and front of something and in this particular case, Jeopardy, the home game, was owned by Merv Griffin Productions. And they took me to federal court um, saying it was a copyright infringement, Eric. I think we've discussed this once before. But the, no, it's worth it here. Yeah, yeah no, we'll, we'll just go through it. We, but they, me and the magazine were, were sued for copyright infringement by Merv Griffin Productions. And we went to federal court and the judge was up on the bench and he was handed the actual sexual jeopardy, the home game. And he just starts laughing his ass off on the bench, Eric. And yeah, here are the, uh, 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 the questions. Um, <laughs> and the judge dismissed it under parody guidelines, which was rightfully so, which is what we wanted. But to hear that federal judge uh, laughing up on the bench was worth the price of admission. So uh, sexual jeopardy, what is parody? Yeah, it's a good question. What is parody? Taking, no, I mean, a Jeopardy that, question. In, excuse me? It, as in a Jeopardy question. What is Jeopardy? What is oh, parody? Oh, right, right, right. So. Well, parody and political satire, there's a thin line between the two of them. Like, the, the, the thing I did with Klaus Barbie was a political satire. Uh, sexual Jeopardy is a parody of Jeopardy. That's a little different here. Oh, here's some stuff. Um, yeah. What is Klaus? Oh, there he is. Oh, look at that. Look at all that crap. Oh, there he is. Yeah, so there's Klaus Barbie. There's his SS uniform. They're all numbered, so you can cut out on either page. I think it was three pages. Maybe we just have two here, Eric. I think there's a second page to this. Yeah, there, there is. But okay. I, I want to let everybody have a chance oh, oh, yeah. to look. Okay, so yeah, so there's the bloodstained. I mean, there's his Lido hose and there's his jail uniform. And there's little things, you know, the ball and chain you could have and cut out and numbered and the money and some beer stein there, some other weird, a blowtorch. <laughs> but you got the idea. So this was political satire. And uh, I think Ralph Reese did the illustrations there. And if you look at um, another one I did called Capitalist Hall of Fame, for instance, these are back to front plaques about really bizarre, greedy capitalists and robber barons. So, yeah, like here's the front. We made it look like the 1890s, 1900s. There's Hetty Green, the Rockefeller. Um, I think there's a Kennedy up there. Uh, some other uh, various. Hold on, let me see if I can blow this up. Oh yeah. Oh, it's still kind of small, but yeah. Here, I'll, I'll just go a little. Higher oh, there. look at that, Henry Ford. Yeah, J uh, Kennedy, William Randolph Hearst. Right. Hetty Green. Hetty Green was the witch of Wall Street. Yeah, <laughs> she. She was. And if you look at the flip side now, this is illustrated by great. Yeah. Now you're seeing the little bios about all of them, but it looks like you're looking at the back of, the, you know, it's reversed art. And this is something I really got into doing it when I was at Lampoon was doing this type of uh, spacing and art and information about these people. This is all true, of course, everything on the back here. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, this allowed me to do something stylish and avant-garde and still have factual stuff. I was always into factual stuff, even at Lampoon. I was not interested in writing fiction like a lot of those guys do. Uh, or did you know what I mean? That wasn't what I was into doing parodies of Cosmo and mm. you know, parody articles. I wasn't really into that. Those guys were masters at that. So I just found this niche where I could focus on um, this particular thing here. So that being said, um, it led me to National Lampoon's mass murder trading cards. I think this was in 85 also. Same idea. Uh, this is the backside of the baseball cards. As I said to Eric before, the Associated Press, this is page one. I think there's about four pages of these. The Associated Press had ranked the mass murderers in America 
like they were the home run hitters in the National League. And they used the same font. They used the same style. And it outraged me that they were glorifying this. Well, hold on, go back for a second there. I just yeah, no, to... sorry. Yeah. Which one do you um, – let's go here because then they're at least upright. Right, yeah. What, what outraged me is the Associated Press, which I uh, uh, thought was a glorification of, of these mass murderers by ranking them – uh, in the highest numbers of killings on down the line, like it was Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. So I got the idea to do these baseball cards and I included, you know, I did the research on them and on the back of the statistics and, you know, uh, that's Whitman obviously. And I think that's, um, is that uh, Unra? Oh, Howard Unruh. Howard Unruh. 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 Yeah. Unruh. Sorry. Very interesting character from uh, Camden, New Jersey. Um, oh yeah. Harvey Glattman is on there, the road murder, but, Unruh went to downtown Camden and shot everyone up in an office. He was one of the original um, disgruntled employees. And you got There's, the big one, Starkweather, Speck. Right, Fish, yeah. Gein. Yeah, Ed Gein, obviously. Some um, classics. You know, th these you, guys inspired Psycho. Right, absolutely, especially Ed Gein. I mean, yeah. Johnny Carson used to do an impersonation of Ed Gein. I mean, there were jokes, to, what did Ed Gein keep in his cookie jar? The answer, lady fingers, you know. Ooh. He was a cannibal, uh, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Starkweather, of course, you know, um, and there's uh, Richard Speck. Who... Speck was the uh, first, um, quote, transsexual uh, prisoner. Right. He's also one of the first mass murderers and, you know, like that really broke through on the media. I mean, Whitman does. Whitman, you know, the difference between a serial killer and a mass murderer. America is known for its mass murderers. There are serial killers throughout history, Jack the Ripper, all through the world. Only we have mass murderers and especially at, the, at this time in this period we, we always had serial killers that john wayne gacy is not a mass murderer what mm. i'm trying to delineate here is the difference between a mass murderer and a serial killer that's why they were called mass murder trading cards not serial uh, killers there's a big difference a mass murderer will do it he'll snap he'll do it in one day one event eric you know what mm. i mean that's the difference and these guys for the most part Although Albert Fish, the moon maniac on the bottom. Yeah, uh, Fish, I think, was a bit of Fish a serial killer. Fish might have been a serial killer, yeah. Yeah, he, he was a serial killer, sorry. And yeah. Gein in a way. But the others were, yeah. were mass murderers. And Whitman, you know, to give give Whitman a little bit of credit, they did find a very large brain tumor inside of him. Ah, who doesn't have a brain tumor? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know I mean, I'm just saying it, it did. No, I mean, Kinky Friedman wrote the definitive, you know, the ballad of Charles Joseph Whitman. And, yeah. Mm. Um, in there, he said there was a rumor about a tumor nestled at the base of his brain. And that's in the song lyrics. So you can't go wrong by listening to Kinky uh, because obviously uh, Whitman was in Texas and there's a wonderful documentary about him climbing to the top of the tower. And, uh, you know, he was an Eagle Scout. They always kill their mothers first before they go on these these sprees. The mother always buys it. So kills his mother. And then he and he dragged all the uh, ammunition up to the top of the Texas tower. But I also threw in Union Carbide for a special corporate card because they had released a gas in Bofal, India, killing untold amount of people, that corporate board down there below. Um, hmm. And it was unknown how many hundreds and hundreds of people died from this release of this uh, uh, toxic uh, gas. So I put a special corporate card for them. Today it would be a Pfizer. Back then it was Union Carbide. Yeah, or... Um uh, Monsanto. Would be Monsanto, a, a right. Yeah. They used to have a. Um, Actually, that could be a whole series. Um, you know, Monsanto, yeah, yeah. Pfizer, yeah, yeah. You know, it, you know, corporate cor killers. Yeah, why not? That, there you go. Next, K, next series. Corporate killers with a K. I like yep. that. Yep, next series. And by the way, you started a, a trend on that because they actually do have serial killer trading cards. Oh, yeah. You can find so them all this over. became a big you know. deal, you know, and I did a lot of press about this at the time, radio and some print. Uh, but some people took it seriously and made actual trading cards and serial killer cards for commercial profit. That was not my intention. My intention was um, as an artist to demonstrate this um, glorification of murder. Uh, and ironically, you got accused of glorifying. The murder. Right. Yeah. They come after years later. They said, you're the one who started this. And I have to re-explain myself as to my motivations. It's very complicated for them to figure out some of these people. But they go, what? A parody of murder? I don't understand. What's a, how do you, what does that mean? 
but yeah, that was the original intent behind the mass murder cards. Um, and, and after that, I was able to do different things. Like, um, we did the, uh, dirty joke book, uh, with Gilbert Gottfried, which we, we touched on briefly when Gilbert passed away, uh, last month and, and Gilbert and I went around New York for a year separately, separately gathering up every dirty joke we could from mostly blue collar guys, cops, firemen, doormen, bartenders, cab drivers, dock workers. And, and then, um, then we put it into a special called the dirty joke book, which sold quite a bit. I think years later they made another one called the dirty, dirty joke book, which I didn't have anything to do. With it's it. still, it's still out there. Yeah. I mean, you can find it. It's on eBay. Oh, this Amazon. really? Oh yeah. That's well yeah, worth yeah. it. I mean, it, it's pretty erudite and we divided it up by ethnicity and subject and food. We, we, we divided it up quite a, uh, into some interesting categories. But yeah, so we put out specials. You know, there are special editions all the time in Israel Lampoon. The Sunday newspaper parody from Dakron, Ohio was brilliant, had all the different sections in it um, on real newspaper. Um, you know, we, that was very fascinating. And still, you know, the Lampoon shows were going on. The Class of 86 was a Lampoon show. The National Lampoon show was a show. The Class of 86 show, just to tell you an interesting sidelight, we had a writer's meeting for the what later became uh, National Lampoon's Class of 86, which was a, a descendant of Lemmings, uh, which we'll put up on Locals. I found a pretty clean copy of Lemmings um, with Bellucci and Chase and everyone, the original National Lampoon Lemming show. Uh, yeah, this, this is from the album. Um, the show is... Um, uh, you know, nicely recorded by somebody. I don't know where they got that. But in the in the Lampoon office, we had a recording studio where these albums were made, and and uh, Bellucci and 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 the Murrays would come up and record, and and all these different people who later became SNL. So all of these albums were made in the same office where we worked. It was just a little tiny, and I mean tiny, uh, recording studio inside the office at Madison Avenue, 59th Street. Which so was a quick, pretty, tiny room with padded walls, I'm sure. Yeah, and yeah, that's all it was. Yeah, that's all it was. And microphones. It was very low key, but it was technically the, the equipment was perfect. There's nothing. You know, it's like there. a podcast studio of now. Yeah, yeah, the equipment <laughs> was perfect. It lasted for years, and there was a mail room, and there was different people. That, like I said, there were these older people, like Howard Jarofsky, who ran the magazine, who were like these guys who would show up from Long Island and just go. Get in your office, do something, you fat bastard. You know, I mean, it was jocular, you know, but they would make sure. But it's still, thing... kid, you call that kidding on the square, on the square. So it's like, right, right. Yeah, ha, 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 it's a joke, but no, no, oh, right. get in okay. your office. Yes, yes. <laughs> they were harsh. They had to be, though, because we were psychos. They, I mean, they had, a, they had a magazine to put out every month. So, I mean, putting out a monthly magazine is grueling. It really is grueling. Eventually, at the very end, they went to buy monthly uh, every two months, which was a bigger magazine. But boy, that was a vacation, putting out one every two months. <laughs> oh, now you can really stretch out. But putting one out every month, at the last five or six days, that's where you know substances had to be flown in. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> because we just weren't going to make it unless substances were airlifted in behind the Berlin Wall where we were. I, I'm sure they didn't. Uh, they, they weren't inspiring anything uh, prior to no, that. No, they didn't care. They just wanted us to get the goddamn thing done. Now, one of the other high points of the magazine was every six months or so. I don't know the timeline. Six months, maybe every year. I don't know. It was rough. They would bring in new models for us to hire for future photo layouts. And they were nude models. And we would get a 12-foot sub hero. For lunch and all the, the editors and writers would be in this boardroom with these girls who were models who would come up and model nude it was the greatest day of our lives it was just the greatest day to be at lampoon and you know they were there for that purpose they were there as nude models so it wasn't like you know anything salacious or, you know they knew what they were coming for but man that was a great day that was really a great day because we used a lot of them in the photo funnies eric and I don't know if you could show any. Oh, here's another special we made. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them are me in there. I did a lot of the photo funny. Right. And the ones that you did all have nudity. So I'm using this one as a representative of. Um... Right. The, this is the cover, right? Right. This is the cover, but you get the point. 
Yeah, you got <laughs> the point. Yeah. So, yeah, these are, these are special editions we put out. But within the edition, Doug Kenny started these things called fumetti's, which is an Italian uh, phrase for photo layouts with these blurbs like cartoons on top of the people's heads. But mm -hmm. it was a photo style of a comic book called the fumetti. And that started under Doug Kenny. And he started the things with the nudity and some breasts being exposed. It, it was light. It wasn't anything crazy. But in Italy, they don't care about stuff like we do. You know what I mean? But when they did Baby in the Blender and Donald Wildman um, came after us and the Ed, Me Ed Meese had started, he was the Attorney General of the United States, Meese started a commission. Mm -hmm. what, what happened was Playboy, Penthouse, and Lampoon had to be taken off the newsstand and put behind the counter. Paper. So you, what's that? Paper and wow, um, I got interrupted for this one. Jeff Stout for the book fund. Yeah, look, I mean, that's uh, a lot of that's a lot of book fund. Thank depends, you. And depends what the books are, but Stout's a real man, that, and <laughs> his name will live in infamy and fame in this world wherever we are in this in this uh, uh, YouTube world. This yes. is great Thank stuff, you. Jeff. Thank you so much, Jeff. So the situation becomes like, you know, uh, Ed Meese comes after us. Donald Wildman comes after us. And this is all because of Baby in a Blender. And we start to lose major advertising. And all three of the magazines had to be behind the counter is really my point. So when you have three major newsstand driven publications, and these were newsstand driven as opposed to phony subscriptions, which a lot of publishers were able to create phony numbers of circulation, mm -hmm. as I discussed with you. We'll, we'll get into this later because I was also associate publisher of Heavy Metal Magazine, which was our science fiction art magazine. Sister publication of Lampoon was uh, Heavy Metal. We had a lot of French artists in there and uh, we had a lot of, of, of sci-fi, you know, intergalactic mm -hmm. sex scenes and everything. But, you know, it was a, a work of art. I mean, heavy metal was great. That led to heavy metal, the movie. We'll do a separate episode about that. Somehow, I don't know, I ended up as associate publisher of that too. I don't know how that happened, but, you know, I just, I just said, okay, whatever. So once we were removed from the newsstand, that meant you had to go into 7-Eleven, not see it and ask for it, thinking that you knew all this crap. But you didn't. So you just didn't see it. And it killed us. I mean, the circulation went from a million to 250 in the span of two years. I mean, oh, it just sure. literally destroyed the not just us. It, it, it really hampered Penthouse more than Playboy. But Playboy took a real bloodbath also on this. And that was the intention. Remember to subscribe. You see, folks, because we could be suppressed, too. That's exactly a similar thing as that was the algorithm before there was an algorithm suppressing the magazine. Right. And thank you, Kathy. You love all of our stories and channels. You would love to hit the like button, but what if you don't like it after? You know what? We'll take cash too. Is there an unlike button or no? Yeah, you just keep hitting it. Oh, but, there's the dislike button. Right. Well, right. Yeah, oh, yeah, there's that too. But you know what? Cash works. I mean, if you if you don't want to hit the but like button and you want to send cash, we're all right. We'll we'll, we'll take that. No, no and now problem. back to our show. Oh, wait a like second. It. There's lighting up, Merv. The uh yeah. yeah, Merv, I don't understand what that was about. And we I was in Austin couple. for Whitman. Yeah, wow. The old and, one. Everybody in Austin, I guess, grabbed a, a gun. I used to budget to afford buy a lampoon. Yeah, it wasn't that expensive. No, but, but it, was, it was a big deal, though, at the time. Right. I, it's funny because I just got a copy of Penthouse from 1973 for that assassination tapes article I was telling you about. And the paper stock in that Penthouse was, I, I was just almost having an orgasm from the paper stock <laughs> as a publisher. I just couldn't believe how rich, rich, yeah, how it, rich it was. This was at Penthouse at its peak. They were spending money and then they spun off into Viva, not, no relation to Viva in Canada, but Viva was a woman's version of Penthouse. And then the science fiction magazine Omni came out. That was run by- That uh, also had really gorgeous paper. What I love about oh, that though is, you think about it at the time, it might have been monthly, but like Omni, I think, has been out of business for years. Yeah. And those magazines, they hold up now. So they're oh, like, absolutely. they're really absolutely. a collector's item and they were made to be available for generations further. <laughs> These are still in good shape. I mean, this is um, 80. This is one of the special 80s to look back. And oh, this check was, this out. Faster Man. To, good friend of mine wrote two of the songs in the movie Heavy Metal. Oh, right on. Faster yeah, I mean, Man's a photographer and has offered his stuff up for us if we ever want. It's a rock photographer. 
the um, part of the problem with the movie was the mu music rights. There was just so many bands that had blown up oh, yeah. um, that we couldn't. It was beautiful to watch. You had to take some sort of psychedelics. But the point of the matter was it was revered as an underground classic, you know, um, at that time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll do a separate episode. I think For sure. That, that may cut as a separate episode. But just to get back to who we were, I mean, we had Ratso there. And Ratso had come over from High Times. He brought uh, Chris Howland with him. I think it was the art director at High Times. Ratso came on board. And then we had the Simmons brothers, myself, uh, Dave Hansen, who oddly enough's mother or stepmom had an office upstairs and ran a porno magazine business with uh, magazines called Leg Show and other types of high end, um, you know, chic kind of, um, there's Ratso. Yeah, that's okay. So this was our our Alex Jones back then was a guy named Al Goldstein from Screw Magazine. That was the Alex Jones. He he was our East Coast version. He had a giant Rolls Royce and he would come by and take us down to Chinatown to a restaurant called Big Wong's where he would buy us all Chinese uh, uh, dinner. And Ratso was very tight with Al Goldstein. And w even before I was an editor, though, I remember looking up to these guys as gods who were the editors in the 70s because you know, I was hanging out with them. It wasn't like I just came from another planet through Michael and the family. I was like we would go with Ted Mann and some of the other editors to Rodney's club, Rodney Dangerfield's nightclub. And Rodney would put us in a special booth in the back and then we'd watch Rodney work and we would just you know, be dying and then follow Rodney into the men's room where he would do a second act in the men's room just cutting up for another hour but that whole world was still even though i wasn't an editor yet it, i was still part of that uh, zeitgeist you're part of the gang so to speak oh. right of these guys so i mean it wasn't like all of a sudden somebody <laughs> plopped me in through cronyism but it was cronyism in a weird way but i had the talent to, to do the work so i don't know what you call that you know i mean i, I mean like that's the way it works. <laughs> I know. No, I, I, yeah, it was just weird because, I mean, it was always expected that when Michael came in that I would come in with him and that he was always expected to take over at some point. And he wrote a column called Drinking Tips. And, you know, he was tight with Kinky Friedman and Kinky was in New York at a place called The Lone Star, where he was doing a uh, weekly thing at The Lone Star. And Kinky owned New York at that time. He was just killing it with the Texas Playboys and had written the ballad of Charles Joseph Whitman and ride him Jew boy all around the old corral. Uh, just he was killing. It. He was like a, a country version of Lenny Bruce right out of Texas. And um, everybody became fast friends. The guys from Sleep at the Wheel and uh, Cody and those guys and uh, Andy Stein. It was a whole group of people who were in, interlocked, uh, mostly in New York at the time in the mid 80s. Um, there was a club called the Bells of Hell. Uh, which was very popular, um, as I said, the Lone Star Cafe downtown, you know, where we saw the Blues Brothers try out the, a primitive version of the Blues Brothers, where mm. they would go up on stage every week. We didn't know that was going to be the Blues Brothers, but they would come up and, and Michael would, Michael knew them, of course, because he grew up in Lampoon. And Michael knew everyone because his father was the owner, but he knew all these guys. I mean, that's how I knew met Dan Aykroyd and did acid with him and that's how, I mean, that's how I, you know, stayed in a bed on liquid acid with Al Franken and one side of the bed and uh, his partner, Tom, on the other side, completing sentences, you know, Franken and Davis. Um, <laughs> it was a weird ride. But this was before I, I even got there. And even when I got there, we still would go to the Burnathon um, upstate New York between Gayhead and Climax. There was a farm there. Uh, run by uh, a guy from uh, Florida. Um, I won't say anything more about him. The wild, He was called the Wild Boar. And um, Gerard Wagner, I, he's long dead now. But um, when Franken was running for the Senate, he sent around an email to everyone not to mention... <laughs> not, not to mention these events. Okay. And, and, I yeah. hope you saved it. <laughs> It's in there somewhere. I mean, but it was, we were all informed that we were not supposed to talk about this particular stuff about the Burnathon. And he writes about it in one of his books, like Rush Limbaugh's a big fat idiot or something. He talks about it, he changes all the names mm. and he doesn't get into the debauchery. But the Burnathon was like a huge barn fire. And we'd have a softball game. We'd put an entire car in the barn fire. 
bikers, hundreds of people, chaos, a ranch up in Climax, Gay Head up in that area in um, Greene County, New York, which is where Sonora House was, coincidentally. This guy um, had two bars in Tampa called the Wild Boar One, the Wild Boar Two, and his number one drinking guest or uh, customer was Jack Kerouac who lived down there at the time. So Wagner hmm. later taught poetry at the University of Florida, and he was our connection to Kerouac uh, generationally. You know what I mean? That this guy was a very close friend of Kerouac's. But there were certainly other people there uh, from Saturday Night Live, and it was kind of like a lampoon SNL uh, debauchery weekend. You know, usually. Well, so, Saturday Night Live, wasn't that kind of fed out of lampoon in a way? Yeah, I mean, it comes out of Lemmings. It comes out of that National Lampoon show. You know, in fact, they went to Maddie and they offered it to him from NBC. And um, he wasn't interested in that at the time because he Probably to was his too credit, busy. No, no, he was. I, I mean, to his credit, he was going for bigger fish, which was the movie business. And hmm. he really didn't want to be involved in TV. Um, I mean, you couldn't see the success of SNL late night. I mean, you say it now, but I mean, nobody had ever done that back then. So it would have right. been a real risk. And. You know, he ends up bringing these guys back around because who's the star of Vacations? Chevy Chase. I and, mean, the, um, the, Animal yeah. House. And Animal House. I mean, so, I yeah. mean, who are these people? The same people. Yeah. You yeah. know, Lemmings and... Actually, I'll, he helped. It, it, it's You mentioned that, but at that time, people were either television stars or movie stars. So he actually helped cross that divide because John Belushi was a TV star and Dan Aykroyd's TV star, but yet they were movie stars as well. Well, not only that, at one point they had the number one TV show, which was Saturday Night Live, the number one al uh, uh, um, uh, movie, which was Animal House, and the number one album, which was Briefcase of Blues, the Blues Brothers album. They Three. It's never been done before. The number one record, number one movie, number one TV show. It's never been done. And I don't know what kind of awards they got, but they were number one statistically. They you know, cash. They, yeah, they, they, was <laughs> cash was award. <laughs> now, John had a girlfriend who later married uh, Judy Bellucci. And she worked in the art department and um, she came to work one day and her desk had been moved or something. And Bellucci came up screaming and yelling. He went batshit crazy. And Maddie said to get the F out, leave me alone. And then Maddie went to lunch with some money guys. And Bellucci got up on top of Maddie's desk, pulled his pants down and left something in the top drawer of Maddie's desk and then left. So he so, did an Amber Heard on the desk? I, I don't know if that's relevant, but... Uh, he, he intentionally left this thing there in the drawer, right? So when Maddie comes back with these big wigs, they resume their meeting in his office and they start to smell something. And Maddie opens the drawer and just yells John's name as loud as humanly possible. But he was long gone. He was long gone. Now, the same thing happens, not the same results, but again, Michael O'Donoghue has a girlfriend. Ann Beats works up there. They move her desk. I don't even know what the deal is with these desks. They moved or took her desk. And this is supposedly the, there's O'Donoghue. He was psycho. And, and he came up to the office, threatened everybody and quit. And uh, over something to do with a girlfriend working up there, you know, and he was up there. Thank you, M. Straw. Super sticker. So these legends, uh, I don't know what that was, but. You know, you heard these stories up close and personal because Maddie was still there. And there were people, like I mentioned, Howard Jarofsky and the straight staff, the publishing staff was there throughout the whole time. That didn't change. So when you talk to the guys who ran the thing, they would tell you this stuff actually happened. You know, we had uh, Josh. Josh Friedman came up. Drew Friedman's brother, um, brilliant artist, Drew Friedman. If you ever want to see his work, uh, it's in Lampoon, but there's also books by Drew Friedman and Josh Allen Friedman. Uh, did a great book called Tales of Times Square, um, where I give him some inside information about working in Times Square. But uh, Josh Allen Friedman hooked up with a guy named Melly Mel and another rapper, and they did a cover of Dylan's Subterranean Homesick Blues with uh, an electric guitar and these black rappers. And it was absolutely fascinating. Um, and they played it, Ratso played it for Dylan. <laughs> we were all in the office waiting for Dylan to call back as to whether he was going to buy this or release it or, or whatever. And Ratso puts him on the speakerphone and, and he says, well, what do you think, Bob? Should we go with this? And he says, sarcastically, he goes, Ratso, why don't we wait till we really need the money? 
<laughs> and that was Bob's way of passing on it. And we all just cracked up in the office. It was hysterical, you know, because Bob was Bob had written on the road with Bob Dylan and mm. he was named Ratso by Joan Baez during the Rolling Thunder review tour. Um, you're nothing but a Ratso is what she called him. And she was right. Ratso, you go to a restaurant with Ratso. And if he had more on his on, on the check, more food, if his bill was higher, he would just say, all right, everybody split it. But if his was lower, he would go, all right, pony up. Who had this? Who had that? Who had this? <laughs> I mean, you could see, the guy was a legend of this stuff. I mean, really, really sick. Amazing. Jackie Joe, thank you. Um, George, George Plimpton, Plimpton was, was with National Lampoon. National National Did oh, no, Mark no, know no. him? I don't remember Plimpton ever being up there. But um, what's his name was up there who directed uh, Polyester and um, – wasn't Johnny Depp in one of these movies um, with Divine, the, the guy from Baltimore? Um, oh, uh, Waters, John Waters. John Waters. He was he he was with us. And of course, we like I said in a previous episode. That's a psycho. That's a weird dude. He wasn't that weird. He was kind of normal was really the weird thing about him. In person, he was the most normal guy. He didn't even give off a gay vibe. Mm. He was totally a normal cat in real life. Uh, oh, the same okay. with Joe Coleman, who was up there. You know, like I said in the Joe Coleman episode, it wasn't. I don't remember Plimpton ever being up there, though. To be honest with you, I don't remember. Maybe he was early seventies. Yeah, it, it wasn't my time. That's for sure. I mean, Plimpton turned out to be CIA, so he might have been trying to infiltrate. He was funded with the Paris Review through the CIA. It's now been cry, revealed. Crybaby. Crybaby. Thank you. Thank you. Crybaby with Johnny Depp. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now that. You, wow. What a small is. world. Wow, Crybaby, that's right. Great movie. Great movie. Yeah, so he was he was a, a contributor, too, at the time. Um, Tony Kish was up there, one of the funniest men in the history of New York. Um, it, it, was a, it was a good group. And the, the point is, you know, the magazine started to go downhill financially because of this Mies Commission. It had nothing to do with us artistically. You know what I mean? Like, we just did our thing. We weren't involved in the numbers the newsstand the publication we saw the paper change we saw the print change we saw the you know uh, now going by monthly change the pressure was changing but that was from external forces within the office you know eventually we moved from madison avenue downtown uh new york a sort of rent uh there was there was some things going on and then maddie of course sold it to tim matheson and matheson didn't realize um the caveat that Harvard had put in there that you, you can't make movies unless you publish the magazine six times a year. And the magazine was so expensive. Matheson, whether he knew it or didn't want to know it or didn't understand how expensive it is to produce a magazine, um, thought he would just use the name for movies and become, you know, a movie mogul and got, he sold it as quick as he could because he was losing his shirt on it, you know, at that point. But Who owns it now? Because they almost could pull off an online magazine. And do yeah, I, I don't know. I have no idea. I have no. I got out in '89 when the phone rang for me, and it was Bob Friedman from MTV. As we jumped an episode, that was what happened with me leaving in '89. So I was there from '85 to '89, and I was actually sued by National Lampoon for leaving. And they they it never went anywhere because. MTV had so many lawyers that they just crushed them immediately. They said, we'll depose you immediately and we'll get this over with. Uh, the Lampoon's theory was I was an employee, so anything coming across the transom is theirs, Eric, which I, I, I don't know if that's legal. Only, only, that's actually not accurate. Like, if you had written an issue of the new magazine while you were at National Lampoon, then you yes, could claim it was work product. Right, right. I didn't do but that. The, the, yeah, they're trying to stretch it. I think that they were just trying to threaten you because right. as far no, I'm not a lawyer, but as far as I know, unless you're you know creating a work product, like um, it gets squirrely in my business because I work in tech. And let's right. say I'm issued a laptop for my job and I take the laptop home with me and then I create something on that laptop that I sell, I'm not doing it at my office or my work time, but I am doing it on work equipment. And so they might have a claim to it, but right. they don't have that with you or did not have that with you. I'm pretty sure if they just, if somebody offers you a job, they offer you a job. What the hell? I mean, I know. I, 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 well, they thought that it wasn't a job. See, they looked at it like I wasn't being hired and indeed I wasn't, I didn't work for MTV. I was offered money to start my own magazine, which I mm -hmm. did. 
So I wasn't an employee. It wasn't like getting a job there. Lampoon's claim was this was new business. You still came. reported, though, to um, Bertelson, right? No, I didn't report to anybody. I mean, I had my own staff. We took meetings with them. I didn't report to anybody. We took all three people, Bertelsman Music, MTV, and my group, all mm -hmm. met together. But they were, I was an independent company. You know what I mean? Like I was beholden to them because they were huge gorillas. You know what I mean? And they were giving me the money. But it wasn't, so. an, it wasn't an employer-employee relationship. Well, even then, but what if you walked out and you just hung a shingle and said, this is my magazine and bought your own presses and you built it? That's not theirs. They can't say anything. So, Who, Lampoon? or Right, exactly. So I, I don't see how they have a claim. Well, they claim it's new business. And any new business that comes across your desk, you know what I mean? Oh, because you answered your phone at work? <laughs> yeah. Is that, is that I, hung up, I hung up because I thought the guy was jerking my chain saying, you want to start a magazine for MTV with unlimited money and hire all your friends? And I went, Click, you know, I just click, you know, like, what are you jerking me around? And, but it was this guy, Bob Friedman, who, like I said in the MTV episode, um, did indeed ask me to hire all my friends and become Gandhi of publishing. You know, I, I did hire the, you know, great unwashed, impoverished artists of New York and went crazy. You know, it was a successful publication, but I had stock in Lampoon, too. I, I don't remember what happened with that. I, I think I had to cash in the stock or something. But yeah, they attempted to sue, but uh, to no avail. Um, so that didn't really work. But look, when we were there, we were, you know, supposedly trying to write movies or come up with movie ideas that would be the next vacations. Because John Hughes was an editor. He came up with vacations, as you recall. Um, a lot of these movies came out of editors uh, doing stuff. And that's yeah, here's the, uh, uh, the the logo, the, one of the movie posters for Vacation, which did an enormous business. Um, yeah, but it, but it was a franchise. I mean, yeah, it, not yeah. just a movie, it became a freaking franchise. Yeah, it became a franchise. They tried to, to do a sequel to Animal House, which was called Class Reunion, and it just bombed. It had flounder in it, and yeah, there it is. That did, that did not work out. And the people, yeah... Um, I think it, uh, Animal House, Caddyshack, there was like a window of time in there where they, they was super hot. And I think it just mm, kind of died out. Like, well, it died out when interest. Doug Kenny fell off the cliff in Hawaii. That really died out. Well, okay. Well, there's that too. But I'm just saying the I mean, style was, of movie. He was the brains behind all these things. And I mean, there was others. I mean, Chris Miller, like I said, also was a contributor to Animal House. The three of them wrote them all separately and then compared notes and and intersected the three different uh, scripts but you know chris miller was at dartmouth and talked about how universal wouldn't allow him to put in what he put in which is scraping the brains off the tree of a car crash victim into a mug of beer and bringing him back to the dorm where yeah, he I, was I i don't have any idea why they would not allow that i mean i it's obviously good clean family fun geez what, what's wrong with these people i know chris miller um <laughs> brilliant i think he ended up writing some other movies besides i think bedazzled or some other i don't know his credits offhand but he had a lot of credits um he went his separate ways with that but yeah i mean when kenny died when doug kenny died i think uh, a lot of the creativity of the magazine died with him you know but he was spiraling out of control i mean this guy he would go into a meeting in hollywood and he would put a line of cocaine on his arm Eric, and just snort the arm in the meeting I mean, you can't last that long no, in he Hollywood was, doing that. Yeah. He, he just, it was new. Put it that way. It was new. It wow. wasn't like anybody knew. I mean, New York Magazine had a famous cover uh, story saying that cocaine was non-addictive. And people took that literally back in the 70s when it was first coming on the scene. You know, Wow, so it sounds like the, um, the folks that, um, oh, I forgot the name of it. Is it Purdue? Uh, the ones who do Oxycontin. Oh, Oxycontin, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. like they, they read that memo and they said, oh, yeah, non-addictive. <laughs> I just rewatched a movie the other night. It's pretty funny. Called Brain Candy with Kids in the Hall. You may want to take a look at that with the current situation uh, with Big Pharma. It's a send-up of Big Pharma. It kind of went under the radar of the movie. It was the kids in the hall um, acting as if 
the the drug company was a record company and they make this um drug which makes everyone happy this antidepressant and it hits number one on pharmaceutical variety and it looks just like variety magazine and it's kind of like a billboard uh, uh situation but the movie is pretty funny if wow. you could tolerate all the gay transvestite stuff which is <laughs> there's a lot of it it's kids in the hall so it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know what the deal is, but uh, there's a lot of Scottish Canadians in that movie. That's all I can tell you. It's the only, I think it's the only big farmer political satire ever made. And it, I looked at it again because of the times we live in now. And some of it holds up, not all of it. Some of it holds up. Some of it is very interesting. Office Space holds up. That's um, 20 something years old now. Too. Oh, yeah. I liked Office Space. Absolutely. I mean, even Animal House, if you look at it, you know, holds up. I mean, uh, it's not all great, but I mean, how many times have people looked at Animal House? Well, you know what? I think that holds up especially because it was representing history itself. So mm -hmm. it's like it was written out of time for another piece of time. So it's a period piece. Right. And it's easy for a period piece made earlier to hold up now because it's like, well, it's representing the 60s. So this old movie that was representing the 60s, it just feels like the 60s. Right, right. No, absolutely true. I mean, but they all compared their different college notes and, you know, put the, put that into the hopper. Um, I don't know about Caddyshack. Apparently, Kenny, Doug Kenny and Chase had some golf backgrounds as caddies or something, you know. But Chase became best friends with Doug Kenny and they partied and bonded together out in Hollywood. And don't forget, Chase spun off into a movie star. The rest of them did not really do that. I mean, that Fletch series that Chase did, separate from Lampoon, made a lot of money, made mm -hmm. people a lot of money. You know, he might be a dick now, but he wasn't a dick then. You know? Yeah, and uh, Invisible Man, I think he did that one. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, he, in, in a pre-version of Steely Dan at Bard, he was oh, there. Yeah. He was their drummer. I uh, heard he's a good drummer. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Well, he's it. you'll see him in Lemmings. I mean, you'll see him play uh, drums in Lemmings. I mean, it's a real thing. You know, he's a very talented guy. Crazy. Now, this is your boss or who? Eh, not my boss, but one of the bosses. That's Howard Jarofsky on the right. I'm dressed up for some photo shoot. You know, that was this was a photo funny, actually, for something. Ah. One of the photo funnies. But Howard was the guy who busted my balls and busted everyone's balls to get to work. He was okay. a, he was harsh. He was harsh. What'd you call it? When you're oh, kidding on the square, it's just yeah, yeah, that, that, that was said. his thing. Now, George, who was the publisher, was an older, heavy set guy. George would have the entire staff go out with him when he came in at 10 a.m. to find his car from the night before that he got drunk and parked somewhere around the office. So, you see 12 of us walking around the neighborhood looking for this guy's brown Audi the next day. I mean, he's a total alcoholic. Jesus Christ. But George is everyone's in the photo funnies. You know, you see anybody you could drag into it was fair game. And there's some of me selling swag, Eric. I remember we had the photos. Of that me was a heavy metal. I think it, you were posing with heavy metal. I think we had Wally World and some other stuff. Oh, it might have been. I, I sold all of it, right? But I mean, right, there right. was some, there was some Wally World merch and stuff. And I was into swag before it was cooler. You know, this is. But you see, and that's where we're headed. That's where this we're going. Is, that's why this I, is a smooth I, transition here. I, yeah, I forgot yeah. I'm working with a professional publisher here, but yeah. Thank you. Thank yes, you. That's um, what I wanted to tell you. You, you know, we definitely uh, we're wearing a casual t-shirt, and you know, my friend and I, you know, I love hang that. out, and um, we both have the tees. That is one cute dog, Eric. That really is nice, and it's soft. He's got really? attitude. He's chilling. It's small, it's small enough. It's small enough. Yeah, it's, I mean, now you're saying the bear is sold out. Oh, well, it was sold out. I don't know. Okay, maybe it's not back maybe in it's stock. Back. Maybe um, it's back. If people, you know, what they want to wait, I think next Tuesday it's going to be 22% off. It's like the highest amount, but I think everything is on sale now. You know, don't quote me on it, but I, I believe it is. Right. Um, definitely, definitely check it out. And Let me take a look at those photos before you close out. I just want to see what you got up there then. Yeah, well, we've got one thing you didn't bring up, your um, senior citizen. Um, oh, yeah, let me see that. That was kind of cute. Your senior citizen. Let me spread. see that one. This was another weird one. This is where I become a doctor. I wrote this as a medical doctor. If you yeah. zoom in on that, there's a whole chart I created as doctor. Yeah, 
Mark Robert, each body movement. <laughs> I think I found a medical journal about this. Um, hand over mouth, detritus are properly fitted, showing teeth, anger, uh, finger and nostril, large booger. Yeah, I mean, it was a little over the top, but um, a lot of people like this. And in that photo shoot is Chris Howland, who was the art director, uh, as the as the waiter um, serving them on the next page. These models were great. They were fantastic. They were absolutely fantastic to work with. <laughs> Usually you got different actors who were doing this, you know. But you would, you would take, it, it was like making a little movie because you would have to go to a, a studio or an apartment, get these actors, cast them, write the thing. Uh, but it was a, its own little tiny movie in a lot of ways, Eric. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it sounds that way. I mean, I mean, uh, oh yeah, his oh. Jeopardy, right? Okay. Sorry, I didn't know how long the spread was. No, no. Yeah. Let me just see the the layout of the whole, all the different pieces. Yeah, hang on. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's the body chart. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Oh, show that Volkswagen. I just wanted to see that Volkswagen. Well, this is a classic that you guys lost, isn't it? No, we we won that. Oh, okay. We won that. We, the only one we lost was that uh, Minnie Mouse when we had Minnie Mouse uh, on the cover. But this mm -hmm. one we won. If Ted Kennedy had drove, driven a Volkswagen, he'd be president today. Now, this is both political satire and parody because Volkswagen had this campaign that the car floated. And this is obviously a reference to Chappaquiddick and which ended his presidential ambitions. Great political satire and also political parody. So it, it covered both. What else do we have here? That was great. Oh, show that Nixon nose, the Nixon thing. Yeah, this is the latest um, thumbnail. That was right. Nice. Right. right. Well, that was, a, that was a fold-out gate. Right. That folded out to the rest of the nose. That was expensive to make that. That was the cover of the magazine that folded out, bro. That was really expensive. And the leprechaun was, uh, or, you know, the guy at the end, which you'll see when you when you open it up, you'll see the rest of the um, the cover of Nixon's nose lying. Well, not that one. Sorry, that one. Yeah, there we go. Beautiful, beautiful. I never know the order that they're gonna. Um... Right. That's great. Yeah, you could show that Russian girl again because that's apropos to today. <laughs> yes. Uh, based on what's been happening with trans transsexuals, this if you move in closer on that crotch. Well, this, I think people can tell. Oh, they can? <laughs> I mean, come on. All right. Well, this, this, uh, and the oh, hairy man. legs. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> this, is kind of, this was a big deal back then in the, in the mid-70s. Well, this was uh, there was huge problems with um, um, East Germany. Yeah. Especially. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, they were noticeably less feminine, shall we say, because right. they were just doping up like mad. Right. Show me the, the Stevie Wonder one right there. You see the with the red border in the middle there. You'll see that the joke is they started to make 3D movies. <laughs> so obviously you get the joke. I mean, that's not funny. That's sick, which was, you know, uh, um, done by Sam Gross. And that became the Lampoon Show title, uh, which I was about to tell you about. The Lampoon Show, we had a writer's meeting. And for I eventually became that's not funny that's sick uh, based on the Sam Gross Frog's Legs famous cartoon where the people are eating in a restaurant and it says Frog's Legs on the menu and out of the kitchen door <laughs> comes a frog with no legs on a skateboard and they're horrified that was that was Sam Gross and Sam Gross you know made cartoons for the New Yorker and a lot of other great publications as did Gay and Wilson as did a lot of the cartoonists we had you know, worked at the New Yorker and other publications, but we had a writer's meeting with all these different writers for That's Not Funny, That's Sick, which hadn't been made yet. And a guy named Sid Bartholomew, who would later become the art director for the Farrelly Brothers movies, he showed up uh, at the writer's meeting. And I don't know why to this day, why he did this. He showed up with two chimpanzees, two chips, and they jumped around all over the room, shitting, eating, throwing things. And it was just complete chaos. I don't know why he felt it necessary to bring two chimps to this writer's meeting. It was insane. But this guy stands up in the middle of it with a bald head and he yells, I don't have to put up with this crap. 
And he storms out and never came back. And his name was Larry David. And I just remember that story because that was bizarre that A, <laughs> Larry David was there and B, that the chimps were there. I don't even, and Sid uh, later passed away in a uh, drug mishap, but he, um, brilliant guy, Sid Bartholomew. But yeah, I mean, we had uh, different Lampoon show things that we were trying to produce and write for. Amazing, amazing. So um, let me take a look at that um, Zimmerman comic books, by the way. On the bottom, the very bottom of the screen, there's uh, we used to do Zimmerman like Superman, and <laughs> which is Dylan, right? <laughs> right, but Bob sort of liked it from what, the feedback we got. Yeah, he, the adventures of Zimmerman, and he's a master of war, and he's obviously in the Israeli Air Force, and that was a usual thing, but not to be confused with Son of God comics which was another comic book. These were all within the magazine itself. You'll see on this next to the, yeah, this is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ taking on <laughs> various battles uh, and various issues as son of God comics. Uh, I think this was the Doug Kenny invention. Somebody in the chat had brought this up. Which one? Um, yeah. Mocking um, Mad Magazine. Yes. Yes, that was really... Uh, offensive at the time, but Milai was in the news and and the stupidity of it, I mean, the, the sheer brutality of it and the stupidity of it, it was a low point in the war. And um, that was, of course, supposedly Lieutenant Cali. But yeah, some of these some of these covers won uh, awards, our awards, you know, for for excellence in the magazine community. This one, if it didn't, it should have. Obviously, a self-portrait by Van Gogh uh, after he cut his ear off with the banana and his ear, if you notice, on the bottom. I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to look twice at, at a lot of these, you know, including the one, you know, buy this magazine or we'll shoot this dog, Eric. You know what I mean? Like, that was unbelievably enormous when that happened in terms of media. That yeah, thing, that's one of the most fa ma famous the magazine most famous covers cover we ever did. Yeah. Well, anybody. I mean, that, that actually would fall in the top 50 of all magazine covers, probably. Right. Yeah. And, they, and nothing happened to the dog, by the way. But to get that startled mm. look, they shot off a starter pistol in back of him. Ah. <laughs> uh, well, they to picked get... a perfect dog with the, um, even his eye looks like a half black eye to right. reflect the half black. I mean, it's very artistic too, not just a yeah. I mean, good I think joke. that was that was designed, you know, a little bit by the art department. But yeah, this is pretty famous. This is pretty famous, and and you know, it's funny because when the magazine first started, they were ridiculed by Madison Avenue, which is where all the ad agencies were. But then when it had a million circulation and the car ads started coming in, the liquor ads, that's the creme de la creme. If you saw Mad Men. That was, you know, the Mad Men. Oh, this. Oh, my God. This thing. This was before my time uh, by a year, I think. This was in 84. Um, they did a parody of Dianetics called Diuretics. And it's about four or five pages long inside with photos and everything. And they got so upset about this Scientology <laughs> that I, I don't even know how to tell you this, but I'll tell you what happened. They had a guy. I forget his name. I was just asking um uh, just email Tony Ortega, who is the former Village Voice editor who specializes in Scientology. I forget the guy's name. But they had a guy who was former LAPD who was kicked off the force here for running a brothel in Koreatown. He later became the head of security for Scientology. He was a thug, carried a 38 police special, and his job was to muscle people, you know, who were against Scientology. Anyway, I... I get a call on the phone from this guy who says, I'd like you to uh, wear a wiretap and go in and wiretap Maddie Simmons. And I go, why would I do that? He goes, well, I understand you had a disagreement with him when you started the MTV magazine. I was already at MTV at that time. Mm. And I said, well, I don't think I'm going to do that. And this guy went door to door to the editor's apartments, buildings, knocking on the neighbor's doors, going, did you know that your neighbor was a pedophile? And they went, no, you're kidding, Jeff? You know, mocking it. They couldn't care less. You know, he was trying to smear people who saw right through it. Mm. And then he had the gun on him. When I when he, he came into my office later at MTV, and he had the gun. I, I could see the, the shoulder harness that he had, and he wanted me. 
again to help him uh, take down Maddie at Lampoon for this thing for diuretics. Mm -hmm. And years later, years I, I didn't do anything about it, but I mean it was fascinating that this guy was trying to intimidate me to do that. I mean it was kind of weird. But years later, I met a guy in L.A. Uh, who knew this guy who was a, a had a band. And he said the same thing happened to him. We were comparing notes. And he said the same thing happened to me. I go, what was your crime? He said he didn't like the name of my band. And, and I said, that's why he did all that? He goes, yeah, he was really upset that I had this band name and he wanted me to change it or he was going to shoot me. And I said, well, what was the name of your band? And he said, L. Ron Hitler. And the guy had a long beard. I don't know what happened to his band, L. Ron Hitler. But, wow, what a creative name for a band. No kidding. Wow. All right. So, let me see. Back back to the grift, right? I did look. You wanted to know about the bear. Oh, yeah. Bear is. Oh, uh, there's the, which is the bear on the bottom? Yeah. Temporarily out of stock. Oh, see that? Bucket hat's in stock now again, but only the beige and on the black. So out the way. Get that Grateful Dead shirt for. Yeah, whatever. somebody's already got that. And then there really? Other items. Yep. Somebody did buy that, and actually they tweeted it. I think you you were tagged. Oh yeah, somebody yeah somebody tagged me on that. They, the baseball jersey, right or no? Yeah. Oh Wait, my well. God! Look at this. Rolf is throwing down today. Boy, he's really gone Scandinavian on us. Wow! I knew Jeff Stout. I party with Jeff Stout. <laughs> You're no Jeff Stout. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Wow, That's Rob. Great. Amazing. Wow. So oh, speaking of parting, next up is Clay Shaw, right? Well, just before you part, let me just see that grid again. I just want to make sure there was something there I wanted to see. I just want to make sure we didn't leave something out of your uh, uh, collection of it. crazy crap there. Hold on. Hold on. Just really quick. Uh, let, oh, just show them the Abbey cover. with. Lam I just wanted to show the Abbey cover. Well, we did that in Abbey. Oh, we did? Okay. All right. Forget about it. All right. Forget about it. Sorry. My memory's going. I ain't going to last much longer. Okay. So, yeah. Next up is Clay Shaw, um, which I'm not going to get so much into the trial because I think we're going to do Jim Garrison separately. And um, we're just going to get into Clay Shaw, how he got to where he was and who he was and what made him tick and what happened to him. And I mean, we'll mention obviously the trial and stuff, but I'm not going to get into the deep on the weeds on the trial. Uh, Cause that's a whole separate episode by itself, just the trial. But yeah, I, we could do Clay Shaw. I think it's a good follow-up to DeMar and Schilt. Um, Cause they're similar guys in a lot of ways. I, like I said last week, I think Clay Shaw was the domestic version of George DeMar and Schilt an American version. Hmm. You know, he went overseas and then came back, and George Marshall was overseas, and then came here. You know, he was Eastern European, and this guy was American. But uh, I have something that is really rare as part of my Clay Shaw collection that I don't want to reveal until next week. Um, but At the like, end. What's that? <laughs> At the end of the show, so everybody sit through At the, the very end. You're right. This is a rare <laughs> part of my – I just found it. I, I thought I'd lost it, but um, – it's bizarre. It's a uh, Clay Shaw memorabilia that um, says a lot about him. Let me put it that way. A lot of these guys wanted to be other artists and people and business people. I mean, they're never who they say they are. You know what I mean? Like I said, David Atlee Phillips wrote a novel called The Watchman. E. Howard, Night Watch, Night Watch rather. E. Howard Hunt wrote a novel at the end. Everybody's got some other side grift. You know what I mean? But it's it, it's somehow related to uh, like Chase Brandon, who rewrote my recruit script from Langley. Chase Brandon moved, he re retired from the CIA and moved into UFO. Novelist. What's right. that? He's not, he's a novelist now, right? Or no? Yeah, but he specializes in UFOs. <clears throat> oh, okay. Right. right. So he, he moved into the UFO uh, world, you know, from that other world that he was specializing in over there with movies. I don't know what happened to him, but I, I remember him putting out a book on UFOs. All right. Well, Perfect, and we, we got wonderful super chats, by the way. Everybody that was really? amazingly generous. Yeah, I mean, Jeff Stout throwing down. Rolf is coming in on the side. We got a super sticker. But Mark's always open for PayPal. 
you know, the PayPal thing, I can't say enough how efficient this machine that they've invented is PayPal <laughs> and how happy I am to see the PayPals. It really makes me overjoyed. And you can follow me on Twitter at Lord Buckley, uh, which is growing the that whole community. I'm surprised that people give a shit about what I'm saying, but apparently people are amused. And then you've got the Hunley unstructured thing where you, I'm going to put locals. The locals. Yeah. How, how does that work? Unstructured.locals.com. I'm going to be putting up a couple films that you track down, um, a link for subscribers or supporters. So you can follow for free again. Right. But if you want to support us, it's five bucks a month, 50 bucks a year. Okay. And the year works out well because, I mean, you, know, you never know. Maybe one month isn't as good as the next, but you get a whole year, you get a couple months free. And over time, I think it definitely pays itself. Right. There's a lot of rare stuff up there. I mean, these two, these two videos alone are worth it, you know, and plus the scripts and I'm going to put up some of the magazine articles from Lampoon. Um, can I put up the dirty joke book or, or. Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we could do whatever. I, um, I mean, I have a couple of extra copies of the actual book. I mean, hmm. I definitely put that, especially if it's a PDF. We'll, we'll right. I, it's not a PDF though. I'd have to like, somehow copy the entire book but all right i'll figure okay. it out but there's yeah. there's other lampoonology stuff um and uh you know the, we had a softball team called the national lampoon black Sox, and after one brutal loss i think to cosmopolitan we saw geraldo rivera walking his russian wolfhounds and chased him with bats like we we're in the warriors and he just started running down fifth avenue so we had a lot of swag at lampoon including these black satin jackets that said National Lampoon Black Sox, which I still have. doesn't fit, but I still have it as a commemorative item and nice. some Lampoon hats and stuff like that. So these things stay. Do we have a trucker hat, right, Eric? I believe so, yeah. Okay, so that's right. Different caps, yeah. Right. I'm going to give I'm gonna give a couple to some celebrity friends and make them take photos, Eric. There you go. All right, so we'll... I we'll expect start. one from Thomas Jane before the yeah, next Yeah, well, Thomas <laughs> is about to get a little swag, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, Tuesday, Clay Shaw. We'll see you there. Thank you.